I am a Yank in Sussex. One day, while driving through Shoreham by sea, I saw a road sign that indicated a place called Shoreham Fort. Brown road signs like this usually indicate places of interest like parks, ancient things like castles, and so forth. I wondered what kind of a fort it was, so one day when I was at loose ends, I decided to investigate it. Getting there was fairly easy, but it isn't right off the main road. In fact, one has to drive about a couple of miles through a residential area, and without the signs, you wouldn't imagine that there was something like that there. Zooming down from orbit, you can see that this is a defensive position that appears to guard the mouth of the River Ader and its port. It turns out that this is exactly what it was for, coast defense, meaning that it was intended to guard against naval attacks. Another name for Shoreham Fort is Shoreham Redoubt. Some sources say that the fort was also known as Kingston Redoubt, but I have no idea why that might have been the case. Briefly stated, the Shoreham Redoubt, or fort, along with a number of other coastal defensive works, was built in the 1850s in response to concerns over French intentions during the reign of Emperor Napoleon III. It was preceded by the construction of a similar fort at the mouth of the River Arran, near the town of Littlehampton. The Littlehampton Fort was built in 1854 and still exists, but after it was abandoned sometime in the 1880s, it seriously deteriorated and now lies in a greatly eroded condition, partially submerged in sand dunes. In fact, the, the fort can no longer see the sea because dunes lie in the way. The Littlehampton design was determined to be faulty, as its guns had no casemates nor iron cladding or even overhead protection for the troops defending its bastions, making them vulnerable to thrown grenades and bursting artillery shells, as you can see in these photos and drawings. So the design of Shoreham Fort incorporated a number of improvements over the Littlehampton design. Note that I usually like to get a little aerial footage of the subjects of this YouTube channel when it's feasible, and I tried this time too for the Littlehampton Fort. However, the wind was rather strong and gusty, and I could hardly get my drone to keep its camera pointed at the fort. This was the best I could do that day. Here you can see just how much sand has accumulated in front of the fort since it was abandoned. Well that should do it for the design of the Littlehampton Fort that the Shoreham Fort is based on. So let's get on to the Shoreham Fort itself. Let's have a look at the fort. From the air you can see that the basic shape of the frontal works is that of a lunette or little moon. In the terminology of fortification design, this means that it takes the shape of an angular crescent with a convex side facing the sea, or the potential attacking forces, which would be ships in this case, which would be found in the direction of the red arrows here. The guns on the eastern leg of the lunette are optimally placed to oppose ships approaching the harbor's entrance. The guns on the western leg of the lunette, just two of them, are optimally placed to oppose ships and landed troops approaching from the west. This is the primary purpose of the fort's guns, to repel warships that might be attempting to invest the harbor, capturing it in order to facilitate an invasion. The fort's goal is to keep the enemy ships as far away as possible from the port, either by sinking them or threatening enough damage to keep them at bay. Obviously, any determined enemy would not want to be deterred from the presumed mission of capturing the harbor, so the secondary purpose of the fort is to repel any attempt on the enemy's part to capture it and thus end the threat to their ships. So the fort must have design features to defend against ground attack, and it does. From above, you can see that there is a defensive wall between the enemy and the fort's guns. At first glance, you might think that the enemy would be able to fire their own shipboard cannon and break down the wall. However, there is a trick. This wall is called a Carnot wall, named for the French military engineer Lazare Carnot. Ironically, a Frenchman's fortification invention is used here to defend against the French. As a kind of footnote, I should mention that the local pronunciation of Carnot is Carnot. 
I guess I'm being a little Frenchified and preferring the French pronunciation. Anyway, what makes a Carnot wall interesting from the point of view of defense is that it is actually hidden from the enemy's sight by being built at the bottom of a trench that's dug between the fort's guns and the enemy ships and any landed troops. Shipborne artillery would have a dickens of a time hitting this wall simply because they couldn't see it. Attackers still out at sea aren't going to see this wall to shoot at it, and landed troops aren't going to see it until they are confronted with the deep trench. The theory behind this style of fortification is that both ship-based or landed artillery would be firing at low angles towards the fort, and shot would be bouncing off the shingle and frontal glacis more or less harmlessly, protecting the gun crews and the troops defending the fort from direct artillery fire. Now, an approaching enemy cannot stop the fort from delivering punishment without landing troops on the beach under fire, and these troops would then have to advance under fire. Imagine yourself as a soldier assigned to capture this fort, or at least interfere with its operation. After the boat carrying you under fire drops you off on the beach, you'll continue to face cannon fire, especially such ammunition as canister rounds, such as the one pictured here, which was effectively an enormous shotgun shell. Having braved this, if you survive, you will next encounter a 10-foot deep trench containing the 10 to 12-foot high Carnot wall. Now you can clearly see here today that the drop from the beach surface to the bottom of the trench in front of the Carnot wall has a steep but still friendly slope. However, that is only because this fortification has had over a hundred years of wind-blown sand and shingle blowing over the lip. As you can see from this graphic, the slope was originally a vertical wall with a 10-foot drop. It's easy enough to drop down off a 10-foot vertical wall, of course, but what if your attack fails? Good luck with getting out again after getting in. Did you bring a ladder? <laughs> so here you are in the trench facing a Carnot wall. Now you have two new problems. The first new problem is that the portion of the fort's occupants who are not operating the cannon will be on the other side of the wall, waiting at the firing embrasures or loopholes in order to shoot at you. And yes, you can use the loopholes to shoot back, but these loopholes are designed to make it much easier for the defenders to shoot at you than you at them. Your second problem is even worse. While you're dealing with the defenders on the other side of the wall and trying to figure out how to get over the wall, what about that ladder? You'll also have to worry about enfilading or flanking fire from the caponiers. The soldiers in the caponiers have a free fire zone all along the length of the wall, so you'll have to deal with rifle or musket fire from both the front and both sides. But even if you had brought that ladder and got over the Carnot wall, the central caponier has firing slits on the inside of the wall, and there are bulwarks behind which the defenders can still fire at you. All of this means that if you're an enemy soldier attempting to capture this fort, you'd better pack a lunch because you'll be at it all day and you're unlikely to accomplish the mission, let alone survive the experience. Or so it appears. In a few moments I'll explain why it isn't as hopeless as it appears at first glance. I had hoped to be able to get some photos or video footage from inside of one of the caponiers, but in both of my visits they were blocked off to visitors, probably because of the work in process in restoring them. Fortunately, Richard Vobes, the bald explorer, has given me permission to use a part of one of his videos in which he makes a brief visit to the East Caponier before it was blocked off. I'll just let Richard tell you about it. This, they have, as I say, open days, so you can come round um, and learn all about it and go inside. It's not an open day today, so I can't actually go inside, but you can come and just wander around, which is rather fantastic. Now, oh look, you can nip in this bit here. This is part of the Carnot wall and the defence. And in here, as you can probably just see, there is some little windows, narrow windows, a bit like um, the windows you would get in castles or arrow loops. If I come along a little bit more here, originally this was 12 foot high, certainly from the outside. I don't know about on the inside because riflemen would be aimed around here poking their rifles through in case any of the French boats got in close enough. Let's just keep going around to the other end of the wall. Excuse these young men playing and 
shooting one another. Um, it's quite a big, quite a big fortress. As you can see, it's got a rounded top on the very top, which would have made it hard to clamber over if you were the French trying to get in over in the sort of 1850s. But I think we, oh, <laughs> I'm not sure that I can get out of this way. Thanks, Richard. There is a link to Richard's entire video in the description, as well as a link to his channel, and especially a link to his video where he interviews Gary Baines, the founder and chairman of Friends of Shoreham Fort. Richard gets an interesting tour of the fort, including a visit to the central cabinier, where they keep a replica cannon of the type that was used at the fort. So here we are inside um, the Caponia, yep. and it's got a barrel roof. Yeah, uh, which is very strong, isn't it? It's very a fantastic strong. design. Yeah, nearly three feet, uh, three feet thick. The six gun positions of the fort were laid out to accomplish two purposes: one, to attack approaching ships, and two, to defend against land attack. The battery effectively consisted of two sub batteries. Guns one and two on the western limb of the lunette were set up with a dual purpose. They could oppose ships approaching the port of Shoreham, especially from the southwest but could also oppose the landing and approach of ground troops on the west. The rest of the guns, three through six, covered the direct approaches to the fort, although, of course, they could depress low enough to fire at approaching ground troops, if any were foolhardy enough to attempt to storm the fort from directly in front. From a wider angle, one can see here that the guns of the fort could cover a rather broad fan of territory. The limit of the fan, as shown here, was the maximum effective range of the 68-pounders installed when the fort was first built. This purple wedge here shows the area of greatest coverage by all four guns of the eastern sub-battery, as well as that of gun two. As you can see, the seaborne approach to the port seems to be very well defended. That was then, but by the 1870s it was determined that the 68-pounder smoothbore cannons at the fort were obsolete and would not be able to penetrate the newer, steam-driven, iron-armored ships that were becoming common in navies at the time. So there needed to be some kind of improvement made, but it had to be an improvement that fit the available space. They couldn't just install bigger guns. The lunette's design was already rather tight on room to operate the guns, so larger guns would be too unwieldy to be effective. And while breech-loading rifled cannon might have filled the bill, these were not yet available due to technical issues. The solution had been found by Captain Sir William Palliser, an army officer and inventor. He came up with a method of taking still serviceable muzzle-loading smoothbore cannon and turning them into rifled muzzle loaders. It wasn't sufficient simply to take a cast iron smoothbore and cut rifling into the bore. This had been tried, but the higher chamber pressures generated in such guns were enough to burst them, which would kill or severely injured their crews. Palliser came up with an ingenious solution. Take a cast iron gun and bore it out to accommodate a sleeve of strengthened wrought iron. Cut rifling into the new bore, then fire a few heavy proof rounds to expand the barrel sleeve into close contact with the bored out barrel of the gun. This simultaneously strengthened the cannon enough to bear the higher pressures caused by the rifling and provided the spin stabilization needed to achieve the higher velocities and greater ranges needed to fight the newer armored steamship, and at a decent discount in price. Thus it was that Shoreham Fort's six 64-pounder smoothbores were replaced by two 80-pounder and three 64-pounder rifled muzzle loaders. These guns had greatly improved range, accuracy, and effectiveness, being able to penetrate most naval armor of the time. This left one of the gun positions empty. Much later, the three 64-pounders were reduced to two, and the 80-pounders replaced by 90-pounders. Of course, this now left two of the gun emplacements empty, but by this time the fort was reaching the end of its usefulness as a viable coastal defense facility, and so no further upgrades were made. The fort was garrisoned by the 1st Sussex Volunteer Artillery Corps, who were considered to be one of the top volunteer artillery units and even won a prize for the accuracy of their shooting in 1865. 
The Sussex Volunteers were part of a nationwide organization of part-time volunteer soldiers who were raised in concern over possible invasion due to the need for regular army troops being stationed overseas for various purposes and therefore not being available for home defense. In various forms and names, the First Sussex Volunteers continued until 1961, even serving overseas during wartime. An important part of the fort was the barrack block. At the rear of the fort, the barrack block forms the north side of its perimeter. With rifle loops built into its walls, it was possible for the fort to be defended from behind. In here lived the volunteer soldiers when they were on duty. The permanent staff, consisting of a master gunner and some officers, lived here at all times. Although the men were volunteers, and thus part-timers, having dwellings in the local area, the barracks could accommodate them during duty times in dormitory rooms. The barrack was fully equipped, including a prison cell and administrative offices. The battery stores, consisting of gunnery equipment and personal weapons, were also kept in the block. As much as this fort was an improvement over the Littlehampton Fort design, there were still problems which made the fort quite vulnerable. For a start, the fort is on a spit of land which could easily be isolated from support and reinforcement. First, I need to point out that at the time the fort was an active military installation, the heavily built-up residential area now known as Shoreham Beach was mostly open space. The logistics of the fort were complicated because of the Ada River. Resupply and reinforcement needed to travel over a mile along the Shoreham Beach Peninsula, a pathway which could easily be cut off by an invader. After the fort was built, it was determined that the two guns which covered the sea and land approaches to the west couldn't do so adequately, meaning that landing parties could easily attack from that direction and get behind the fort, cutting off supply. And once the enemy had cut off support, it wouldn't be particularly difficult to move up the peninsula to get behind the fort, which had the weakest defense. Among other problems, the gun crews were clearly visible to snipers from certain angles in that direction, making it likely that they could be taken out of action by only a few enemy rifles. Another unanticipated problem was due to the shingle, or pebbles or small to medium-sized cobbles, that covered the beach in front of the battery. Instead of the fine sand one finds on many beaches, the beach along much of the Sussex coast consists of small round rocks of about the same size as the balls and canister rounds. Artillery rounds impacting the beach in front of the fort could throw up good quantities of these cobbles in the direction of the fort as a form of shrapnel, causing injuries to gun crews in much the same way that a modern claymore mine does. By 1871, it was recognized by the Committee on Coast Defenses that the fort was inadequate to the defense of the port and recommended remodeling or even the construction of an entirely new fort. Some remodeling was done, but among other problems, advances in naval artillery had made the fort's magazines vulnerable to offshore fire, and the 18-foot-thick parapets protecting the guns were by then woefully inadequate. Even later, in 1888, a military engineering committee concluded that the fort was, quote, of no practical use except for defense against small craft, end quote, but recommended that it might still be maintained, since it served as a good practice battery for the Sussex Volunteers. The various committees also recognized that the harbor at Shoreham was not of great commercial value, and major cargoes were not handled here. For all of these reasons, by 1900, Shoreham Fort had been abandoned as a military installation. The end of the fort's military career wasn't the end of its usefulness, however. The new industry of filmmaking had taken hold in the local area, and by 1913 the Sunny South Studios began filming at Shoreham. The fort was an excellent place as a set, since scenery backdrops could be sheltered from wind by the walls of the fort. A few early films were partially shot using the sets erected at the fort, but this didn't last long, as the necessities of World War I caused the termination or suspension of much filmmaking in the United Kingdom. This photo is from the first film made by Francis Lindhurst, the founder of Sunny South Studios, called The Showman's Dream in 1914. It was filmed in front of a backdrop fixed to the west side of the barrack block. The director can be seen in the white jumper giving instructions. Besides the period when it was briefly used as a movie studio location, after its closure as an active military installation, Shoreham Fort was allowed to molder. Over the years, the weather brought more and more sand and pebbles into its Carnot wall ditch. 
Here's a photo showing how deep one of the caponiers had been buried in this material. Only the roof is showing. During World War II, the site of the fort became part of an emergency coastal battery with searchlights and two six-inch guns, which were installed in a newly built emplacement on the beach nearby. It is also believed that the searchlight battery may have been used in conjunction with a second tower built further down the beach towards Worthing as an aiming light. Of course, this six-inch emplacement was removed after the war and the searchlight was decommissioned. Afterwards, it was left derelict until 2008 when the National Coast Watch Institution obtained a lease to use it for watching the water once more, though instead of enemies, they're looking for people in danger. The National Coast Watch Institution is an entirely voluntary organization assisting in the protection and preservation of life at sea and around the UK coastline. It was in 1958 that the fort's barrack block was torn down, although the foundations are still visible. A Coast Guard watchtower was built over the West Magazine block, as can be seen in the photo here, but this was later torn down. The West Sussex County Council carried out a partial restoration of Shoreham Fort during 1977 and 78. Here are a couple of before and after photos. A volunteer organization, the Friends of Shoreham Fort, link in the description, is now working towards a full restoration of the fort, including rebuilding the now torn down barrack block to use as a multi-purpose community center. They even have ambitions of creating a World War I memorial training trench on the site and other features making Shoreham Fort a hub for local military history. One of the newer features of the site is a restored World War II Nissen hut that is being used to help protect visitors during inclement weather and serves as a place to store and display historical items. Those who want to visit the fort should know that while it is open every day of the year and there's no charge for entrance, it is only during spring and summer that there are open days, featuring guided tours and such like. See the Friends of Shoreham Fort website for more events information. Fortunately, the defenses at Shoreham Fort were never tested in war. British concerns over Napoleon III's intentions proved unfounded, and instead of war with Britain, he wasted himself in conflict with the Prussians, who eventually defeated him in the Franco-Prussian War in 1871. Ironically, after Napoleon was deposed, he and his family took refuge in Britain, where they lived out the remainder of their lives. This has been my take on Shoreham Fort part of the military heritage of England in general, and Sussex in particular. It's great fun to clamber over the structure and imagine what it must have been like to be a soldier at the fort, and what it might have been like to be a soldier of France attempting to capture the fort. I think I have a dentist appointment on that day. This has been a production of A Yank in Sussex. If you've enjoyed the video, please click the like button. If you haven't already done so, feel free to click the subscribe button along with the notification bell in order to be notified when new videos are posted on the channel. May you have a very nice day.